and uh, today we are uh, joining with the uh, Sri Lanka Col uh, Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine. Uh, this month is the month of uh, acute medicine, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ganaka Sena Ratna, the president of the Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine, to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Chama Radhanukama, who's a senior lecturer and a consultant physician at the teaching hospital, Peradeniya. Oyo to you, Dr. Sena Ratna, to introduce our next speaker. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. Uh... I think you can hear me. Um, thank you, Dinesha. Uh, first of all, I shall thank uh, Prof. Farosh Desanayak and the Council of Ceylon College of Physicians for giving uh, SLCM uh, this opportunity to uh, present, uh, feature in this wonderful session called College Lecture in August um, in the month of acute medicine. It's an honor and privilege to be in this uh, forum. I have the uh, honor of uh, introducing one of the most uh, outstanding prospects and one of our council members, uh, that is uh, Dr. Chamara Dalugama, for, this, for the audience today. Uh, Chamara um, is a consultant physician uh, and uh, honor, honorary consultant physician and board certified specialist in internal medicine. He has uh, MBBS, MD, MRCP UK, MRCP London, and MRCP Glasgow. In addition to that, to his credit, he has uh, MRCP Specialty Certificate Examination in Acute Medicine, uh, Geriatrics, and Endocrinology as well. Um, he has graduated from University of Peradeniya with uh, uh, best class honors at the final MBBS. And uh, he has uh, so many medals. He has won so many medals uh, in during his uh, faculty career. So, uh, without taking much time, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Chamra Dalugama to deliver the college lecture. Over to you, Chamra. Okay. Thank you, sir. Right. Um, so good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much sir, for that generous introduction. And I welcome you all for another uh, college lecture of Ceylon College of Physicians. And first of all, I would like to thank the CCP on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Internal Medicine for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you today. So coming back to today's topic, uh, I agree that this is slightly different from a conventional college lecture topic, and it is about what is acute medicine a physician's perspective. So for the next 25 minutes, what I simply try is to give an eye opening to an important discipline within general internal medicine, right? So before I embark on the topic, uh, let me take a few minutes uh, to present you a couple of case scenarios where are the patients needed admission under general medicine. So coming to the scenario number one is of a 34 year old lady with one day history of progressive low volume weakness. And on examination, her reflexes were diminished. And this is what her urgent blood gas shows. So she had a potassium of 2.3, a pH of 7.13, and a bicarbonate of 50. So a diagnosis of hypokalemic paralysis was made, and patient was started on intravenous KCL. Then the patient was admitted under medicine, and we had a fair question, are we missing anything? So her blood pressure was normal, and when you looked at her oral cavity, there were multiple dental caries. And on direct question, she agreed that she was having dry mouth and dry eyes for last several months. And her urine pH was 6.5. Later on, uh, she had positive rheumatoid factor and positive ANA. And this is what her um, X-ray abdomen shows. So that is nephrocalcinosis. So a simple hypokalemic paralysis was later diagnosed as Sjogren's syndrome with distal renal table acidosis and nephrocalcinosis. So quickly moving to the second scenario is of a very COPD patient with hypercapnic respiratory failure. Patient was being drowsy but tolerating bipolar. So this patient was managed as a COPD exacerbation, had the standard care, had NIMS, steroids, and antibiotics. And then, um, yes, yeah, so she obviously needed admission. So looking at his blood gas, yes, there is hypoxemia and there is type 2 respiratory failure. 
But when we look at this patient from the foot end of the bed, he is puffy and bloated, but chest was not obviously barren. And for a COPD exacerbation, it was very unusual for him to have a respiratory rate of 8. He was hypoglycemic and his heart rate was 66. ECG showed small complexions and he was hypothermic as well. So very interestingly, when we have taken the bed sheet away, what we saw was this. These are his legs. Yes. So what are we missing here? Yes, you are absolutely right. So this is a patient where we clinically diagnosed as mixed edema coma. And what you saw was erythema abignae, and he was treated with intubation, ventilation, and on clinical grounds, he was treated with NG thyroxine and had gradual warming. And retrospectively, a TSH of more than 100 confirmed our diagnosis. And he walked home on day 12 on admission. Right. So moving to the case number three is of a 55-year-old male who was recently discharged from the medical board after starting anti-TB for a smear positive pulmonary tuberculosis. And he presents back to the board with uh, feeling unwell and dizzy, and he's having a low grade fever and cough. So, on examination, you find his blood pressure is 70 by 40, and there are bivasal force crackles in the chest. So, the house officer very correctly started IV fluids, started antibiotics, but the response to fluids was very poor. So, then the patient was started on a vasopressor. But still, the blood pressure was 80 by 50. So, again, we had the question are we missing anything here? Well, in the background of tuberculosis, yes, we thought whether there is possible adrenal involvement. And also, he was recently started on rifampicin, which is an enzyme inducer which increases the catabolism of steroids, which can easily unmask a relative adrenal insufficiency. So, in this case, IV hydrocortisone did the magic. So, with a shot of hydrocortisone, he made a dramatic clinical improvement. So, this is just a handful of cases that what we see as clinicians attending to sick humans. So the mere fact I want to highlight before starting my lecture is that acute medicine is a speciality which has a broader horizon and a scope, and it is not synonymous with managing, simply managing airway, breathing, and circulation. So acute medicine is taking care of acute medical conditions of a patient. And most of these medical conditions are time sensitive, where early intervention is paramount. So it can be acute stroke, acute MI, sepsis, or acute kidney injury, right? So here, the acute medicine physician need to be fast as well as smart, right? So as you know, in a stroke, a second is important, right? So acute stroke, the time is brain. In acute MI, the time is heart, heart muscle. And in sepsis, a few seconds would prevent the patient going into a multi-organ failure. And in acute kidney injury, a few seconds would prevent a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest. Right. So now I'm sure that you will have this fair question. So what is emergency medicine? What is acute medicine? And are they the same or are they different? Well, emergency medicine is an equally important, well-recognized discipline where the emergency physicians who are involved in emergency management of critically ill, not only medical, but surgical, trauma, pediatric, gynecological and obstetric patients. And most of the countries across the world, they adopt a four hour period for this emergency management. But in acute medicine, the, what we do is the assessment, diagnosis and treatment of adult patients with urgent medical needs. So here in most of the acute medical units function up to 48 to 72 hours. So we have more time for a more comprehensive assessment and treatment of the patient. Right. So this is the scope that I'm going to, this is the content that I'm going to talk for the next 20 minutes. So before I talk about this, let me tell you that acute medicine is a field which is rapidly developing in the world, but in Sri Lanka, we are yet to recognize it as a discrete subspeciality under general medicine. Therefore, what I'm going to talk next in the next few slides is basically the experience coming from overseas, particularly from the UK. And in certain places, I will try to explain how we can adapt these systems from a very local context. So I'm going to discuss what is acute internal medicine, the role of acute medicine physician, and the positive aspects of having an acute medicine physician in an emergency department, the training, and also very importantly, as 
the current situation in the country, acute medicine and health economics, and finally about career directions in acute internal medicine. Right, so who are these acute internal medicine physicians? So in short, acute medicine physicians. So they provide the initial assessment, the investigations, the diagnosis, and the management of patients during the first 72 hours of the hospital stay with an acute medical illness. So this usually takes place in an acute medical unit. So I will explain what an acute medical unit is. And also it is not only providing the expertise in inpatient setting, but also the acute medicine physicians, they provide services in the ambulatory setting. Right, so an acute medicine physician is working at the front door of the hospital and he's working in very close collaboration with the emergency physicians, as well as the primary care teams and see most of the unscheduled medical attendances. Right, so talking about the roles of acute medicine physician. So he is involved in prompt and practical management of acute presentation of medical illnesses. So he's involved in management of acutely unwell medical patients in an inpatient setting. And also you will learn later on that in acute medical units, the patient turnover is high. So patients are treated, and discharge to the community. So the acute medicine physician has to ensure that the patient is safe and there is effective care in place in the community. And he provides the leadership within the acute medical unit. And also he's involved in liaison with the multi-professional teams to promote optimal patient care. Right, so then what is good about acute medicine? So why are we struggling? Why are we striving for acute medicine as a different speciality. So there are a lot of good things for the physician himself and for the patients, for the rest of the staff, as well as for the institute of having an acute medical unit or acute medicine physicians. So from a very doctor's perspective, from an acute physician's perspective, the doctors get exposure to a wide range of medical conditions and they have flexible working patterns and a good work-life balance. And acute medicine physicians get great opportunities to introduce and develop new services and for quality improvement projects. And they get the opportunity to work in a multidisciplinary team. And importantly, they have ample opportunities for practical procedures, teaching and supervision of junior colleagues. So now the whole world, the whole world, the medicine is moving towards this continuous medical education. And then we are going for various appraisal systems. So this is a place where this can be easily achieved. And from a very patient's point of view, so in acute medical unit, there is always a medical consultant, acute medical consultant. So the patients will get access to a rapid consultant review. So that is very good. And all in all, the overall care for sick humans are best in the hands of an acute medicine physician. Right, okay. So let me talk a bit about the history of acute internal medicine. Right, so this was first recognized or introduced as a branch of general internal medicine. And in 2009, in the United Kingdom, this was legally recognized as a separate specialty with a defined, well-defined training program. Right, so let me talk about acute medical units, right? So because when acute medicine physicians, when they manage patients as inpatients, they work in acute medical units. So it's a dedicated facility within the hospital that acts as a focus for acute medical care for patients who present as medical emergencies to the hospital. So coming to a very local context, so this acute medical unit concept can be adapted in emergency treatment units, in preliminary care units, as well as in a medical SDU or a medical casualty ward, or even a front cubicle of a medical ward. So I will next explain, so what are the key features in an acute medical unit? So in acute medical unit, the medical leadership is by a consultant physician who either specialized in acute medicine or who has a special interest in acute medicine. And then this acute medicine specialist with his team will deliver a timely and appropriate interventions. And he will appropriately liaise with the other specialties as well. So the first line treatment is often commenced within this short stay area in the acute medical unit. And then the team will decide on further investigations and will decide on further specialty reference. And the most important thing is that once an acute medicine physician sees the patient, 
the discharge planning starts at the time of admission. So when he sees the patient, he has to anticipate, okay, now whether you can get this patient home at the end of the day, or whether this patient needs to stay for a couple of days, or else this patient has complex medical issues, so that patient will need a longer hospital stay. So if that is the case, the acute medicine physician will lies will lies with the uh, inter other general medicine physicians or with other specialties, and relevant bed requests will be made. And then when you are working in the acute medical unit, there is always a very effective multi-professional team which is working together. And also, in acute medical unit, there are complex ethical decisions that need to be made, right? So from a very Sri Lankan context, assume now we have acute medical unit when we have three sick humans, all need escalation of their care, but we have only one ICU bed. So this is one of the biggest problems that we will have when it comes to resource allocation. So such decisions need to be made within the acute medical unit. And also cardiopulmonary resuscitation status. Although we don't have a legal provision to label the patient as DNA CPR, we do talk about escalation of care. We do talk about this is a ceiling that we are going to treat for this patient. So that is again a complex decision that we will have to make in the acute medical unit. And also we find patients who are aggressive, combative, as well as unwell. So deprivation of liberty orders, restraining patients, all these things are a part and parcel of an acute medical unit. And also a medical acute medical unit have the facilities to conduct practical procedures. So this may be uh, therapeutic or diagnostic procedures. Say for instance, a lady come in with a thunderclap headache with a normal CT. So you should have the facilities to do a LP for CSF xanthophobia. So there is a pan coming with a rod, uh, red hot joint. So you have the facilities to do a knee joint aspiration to exclude septic arthritis. Or else you have a patient who is very symptomatic with the pleural effusion. So the acute medical unit should have the facilities to get an IC tube in. Right. So, what are the advantages of having the acute medical unit? Well, although I present facts here, all these facts are coming from uh, very high quality research where there are systematic reviews and meta analysis which compared these acute, acute medical units with the previous standard of care where they had this emergency department and then the medical wards. So importantly, the delivery of high profile quality initiatives, particularly it was found that in the standard care, the management of sepsis and AKR, they're not optimal. So there were a lot of casualties, a lot of morbidity and mortality associated with these conditions. But in acute medical units, with the introduction of protocols, algorithms, they provide very high profile quality initiatives for these conditions. And also this is the starting point for generic care. So the acute medicine physician will look at the patient and then decide how long he's going to stay. And there are certain uh, criteria that we will look at and see whether this patient is at risk of developing venous thrombosis during the inpatient stay. So in such patients, venous thromboembolism prophylaxis can be started. An acute medical unit will have early access to diagnostic services. A patient come in with a unilateral weakness in acute medical unit will have rapid access to the CT room within seconds to minutes and the bleed will be excluded and the bleed will be considered for thrombolysis. And also they have rapid access to higher level of care like HDUs and CCUs. And the specialties, the respiratory physicians, the nephrologists, the cardiologists, intensivists, they are waiting to give their input to an acute medical unit when there is an acutely unwell patient who needs organ support or specialist opinions. And very importantly, in acute medical unit, there is an acute physician on site. So there is ready availability of advice and specialty management pathways. So now you will understand that having an acute medical unit is very advantageous from the patient care point of view. Right. So. The next part of my lecture is that acute medicine is not only in acute medical units or not only for inpatients, but as well as for ambulatory care or OPD setting. So there are certain acute medical conditions such as deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and even cellulitis now can be treated very safely as outpatients with the help of acute medicine physician-led 
ambulatory care services. And also, these acute medicine physicians can have rapid access medical clinics to allow unwell patients to access consultant physicians and rapid diagnostics without admission to the hospital. Okay, so let me tell you an example, right? So this is Mrs. X, a 52-year-old lady who is coming with a right lower limb pain and swelling. So she's a diabetic and her white count is 21,000 and a CRP of 320. So what would you do for this patient? Obviously, she has a pretty nasty cellulitis and she needs IV antibiotics and she needs admission. So provided that she's otherwise all right, hemodynamically stable, can we manage her at home? Well, that's a fair question. So this is what is done elsewhere in the world, particularly in developed countries. So there is outpatient antibiotics. So there are acute medicine specialists, led AHA team or acute hospital at home team or an OPAT team, which is called outpatient parental antibiotic team. So basically this team has an acute medicine physician and there are acute medicine nurses. So these nurses visit this patient at home and then assess the patient's hemodynamics and then administer the antibiotics. And if they have any concerns, they can very easily escalate into the, the consultant physician. And then the problem is like, say for instance, this particular patient, if we decide to start on fluoxacillin, he needs every six hour. So it's not feasible for a nurse to visit this patient's house six, four times a day to give the antibiotics, right? Therefore, there are certain things that have been adapted. So there are certain antibiotics like keftraxone, which can be given as once a day. So the nurse has to visit only one time a day. But more than that, there is this fancy device, right? So this is called an elastromeric device, which is widely used in developed countries. So basically what it is, is this is a simple, very small device. It looks, I think, larger in this slide, which can be connected to a peripheral vein. And this is a balloon. And then certain antibiotics like piperacillin, tazobactam, fluoxacillin, keftacidim, and merapenem can be instilled into this balloon. And there is a mechanism in this balloon such that it gradually deflates and administer the antibiotic over a 24 hour period, right? So even in wards, we give certain antibiotics like merapenem in slow infusions in frequent intervals. But in this device, it will make sure that the antibiotic is given as a continuous infusion over a 24 hour period and which is very effective. And the patient uh, input regarding this, like patient's opinion is very satisfactory. Right. So let me tell you another example where the acute medicine physicians come in the ambulatory care. So we have a 54-year-old male who is COVID positive, managed at home, and he presents with a right-sided pleuritic chest pain to an acute medical unit at 6 in the afternoon, 6 in the evening. His D-dimer is closer to 1000, but CTP is not available at the moment. So what would you do? Will you admit, because there is a high risk of pulmonary embolism, and will you admit this patient? So, so the acute medicine physician would calculate the PCE score of this patient. Basically, what it tells is the risk of death within 30 days and the risk of complications. So in this particular patient, when we calculated the PCE score, basically he has a zero score. So he has a very low risk of complications. So what we do is a treatment dose of inoxaparin and then safety netting and get him home and get him the next day morning for a CTP, right? So this avoids an unnecessary overnight admission in the, in the hospital, right? So, right, so that is about acute medicine and ambulatory care. So let me briefly talk about the training and trainers in acute medicine in UK. So in UK, there is a five-year acute internal medicine program with the general internal medicine training within the general medicine training program. And this trainer, this train is, will have rotations in respiratory medicine, cardiology, elderly care, and critical care. And they do the standard medicine on call as well. And very important, this is very interesting that these trainees are given a dedicated time to learn certain skills. So they learn a procedural skill. So it could be the echocardiogram, endoscopy, or bronchoscopy. And also, as I mentioned earlier, the acute medicine physicians, they give the leadership in acute medical unit. So they need to know the leadership and the management. So most of these acute medical trainees either do a diploma or a master's on this. 
And again, they learn another area of medicine, such as palliative care, inpatient diabetes, or stroke medicine, or even geriatrics, because it is a part and parcel with the acute admissions that you get. Right, so coming to the uh, latter part of my presentation, acute internal medicine and health economics. Right, so this is a very important area because uh, this is very applicable to the current situation in Sri Lanka as well, where we are, in, we are very economically and politically at a very disadvantaged state. So as a very poor, very resource poor country, when we are managing these acute patients, we can't manage based on large number of blindly requested investigations, thinking something might become positive or negative so that you can come to a diagnosis. Now, that's not the way in acute medicine teaching. So acute physicians are geared to uh, sort of do a target, take a focused history, do a targeted examination, and then to do a very selective essential investigations to come to a diagnosis, right? And the other thing is uh, studies coming from various systematic reviews and meta-analysis comparing the acute medical unit or the acute medicine model with the previous standard where they had the ED and the medical boards. So all these are very statistically significant observations. So there is a reduction in hospital admissions by AME, right? So now you know what is the reason, right? And then there is a significant reduction in the length of stay in the hospital. And at the same time, the inpatient mortality. So number of admissions and uh, lesser stay in the hospital that has a very good impact on the health economics or the cost for each patient. And then you might wonder that acute physicians, they are at the front of the hospital, they see the patient, they treat the patient and they plan discharging at the time of admission. So there is a possibility that there may be a lot of free admissions, what we call as failed discharges. But this meta-analysis shows that there is no significant difference in readmission rates in acute medical units. That is mainly because even though you discharge a patient early, there is a very organized set protocol in community to look after this patient. And the other important thing is the reduced emergency department access block, right? So in UK, a uh, word that we often hear is what we call, we are in Opel 4. Now the hospital is in Opel 4 and everybody is frightened and everybody is stressed. So this Opel 4 is, what it stands for is operational pressure escalation level 4. So that what it means is, in very simple terms, it is much broader than that, but all the hospital beds are occupied particularly in the emergency department, all the beds are occupied by the patients. So that they tell that they are unable to deliver a comprehensive care and the patient's safety is at risk. Well, this is somewhat different in our setting because we do manage acutely unwell patients on the bed, under the bed, and in between beds. But in UK, what they do is once the beds are occupied, they will no longer accept patients. So this was the biggest issue. But after introduction of the acute medical units with the rapid turn of the patients and more comprehensive assessment of the patients, this emergency department access block was significantly reduced. And then the doctors, not only the doctors, the staff, the nurses and the other supportive staff had a very good job satisfaction when it comes to acute medical units. And all in all, the patients were well treated and they had a better patient satisfaction. Right, so now coming to the last slide of my presentation. So what are the career directions? What are the things that we can do to improve the knowledge and skills of internists with regard to acute medicine? So the MRCP specialty certificate examination in acute medicine is one of the very good examinations that, uh, that we can take up. And even you can do it from Sri Lanka itself. And then once you have the MRCP diploma, as well as a training in acute medicine, this can be used as a post-terminal qualification. But more than adding letters at the end of the name, this MRCP in acute medicine, the examination, once you do it, it will boost you with the knowledge, skills, and confidence in managing patients with acute medicine. And then always this society, the Society for Acute Medicine UK, is one of the uh, best societies which will cater for acute medicine. 
So I think getting the membership of this society is a good investment if you have a career interest in acute medicine. And of course, you can get the life membership for a very, I would say, very reasonable price. And this society promotes the education of not only doctors, but nurses and paramedics in acute medicine. And they sponsor for a lot of research in acute medicine, and they share good practice, and they share various models that we can adapt in acute medicine. And importantly, once you are a member, you get the full access, you get the full free subscription for the acute medicine journal, which is one of the best journals in acute medicine, which is very much updated. And also you get the access to the uh, acute medicine newsletter. And then this society offers various focused uh, ultrasound courses. The famous and the fusic is one uh, a course which is offered from the Society of Acute Medicine. And I mean, not only the famous, because it's not available in Sri Lanka, but there are so many other local courses which are uh, sort of there to improve the skills, point of care, ultrasound skills of the internist. And as a college, I'm very proud to tell that we have a lot of uh, consulting physicians in internists who are well trained and who are accredited on doing this point of care ultrasound. And as a college, we do a lot of courses on point of care ultrasound, uh, point of care ultrasound to improve the skills of the physicians. Right, so that brings to the end of my short lecture. So once again, I want to tell that acute medicine is an evolving branch in general medicine, which has a very positive impact on managing patients, managing acutely unwell patients. And as a country, we are yet to recognize this uh, specialty um, in general medicine, but I believe that this lecture will be an eye opener and then uh, you will understand the role of an internist or a physician in managing an acutely unwell patient as a holistic care provider. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chamara Dalugamba, for that excellent talk. Um, uh, if the virtual audience has any questions, you can ask now. And I would like to make a comment. Uh, thank you for the brilliant lecture. And uh, this actually, it's an eye opener, and especially in a, in a country like ours, which is resource poor, and it's the way forward for us uh, to manage our resources. And we have few challenges, uh, like you said, uh, especially OPAT, like outpatient management of acute uh, admissions, the patients who are clinically stable. Um, the transport had been a challenge now uh, these days, but I'm sure like in the future, um, all acute medicine physicians can work together and uh, start and uh, we can move forward uh, to that uh, aspect in management in patients with acute medical problems. And uh, are you aware of um, any uh, outpatient management, uh, at least uh, for infections, lungs? I think and not at the moment, but that, that's a feasible option. But given the current situation in the country, we might have to wait for a while. But these are options that as a college and both the College of Internal Medicine as the Ceylon College of Physicians that we can sort of discuss and work together to uh, make it a reality. Um, Shamara, uh, can I ask a question from you? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for that wonderful uh, opening talk. Uh, I really enjoy that. Um, you said something about preventing uh, readmissions. Um, what was that? Um, yes, the, one thing is, yeah, uh, that is one thing is that in acute medical units, there is a rapid patient turnover because the, there is a rapid access for the patient to the consultant and the patient will be relieved and then the basic investigations will be arranged and managed and there are set protocols to manage this patient in the community. Say, for instance, there are OPET teams and there are AHA teams where in case if you want to give antibiotics for say a few days, but patient is otherwise stable patient can be discharged to the community, right? So in that case, uh, what we have done is we have taken a lot of measures 
to prevent readmission, what you call a failed discharge. Therefore, uh, so a study which compared after introducing of acute medical units, although there is a high turnover of patients, there was no statistically significant difference in the number of free admissions. That is because there is a very good system in community in place, particularly with the support of uh, general practitioners as well as the teams like AHA and OPET, where the patient will be given effective care. So in a nutshell, we need to develop those systems in Sri Lanka for us to sort of uh, as an uh, development, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, Dinesha, we have a question, I think, no? Um, this is Saman Gunathilaka. Um, uh, so the PGM has emergency medicine, critical care medicine. So how is acute medicine different? Yes, so yes, uh, that's a question I think we all have. So I wanted to explain that as well because Basically, in emergency medicine, uh, it's one thing is the time frame, right? So emergency medicine not only caters for medical emergencies, but also the other emergencies. But usually in an emergency department, they adapt a time window for four-hour period. But as you know, most, most of the complicated medical emergencies, I mean, the emergency medicine can be life-saving, but then come into a more comprehensive diagnosis and arrange a comprehensive workup for this patient, we need time. And we can't completely rely on the emergency department because there is a rapid turnover there and they need to sort of uh, manage the initial part of the patient, in the initial part of the emergency and do the necessary uh, reference. And then as acute medical doctors, we have time. We have at going up to 72 hours to look into, dig deep into the patient's history and then to arrange further investigations and to liaise with the other multidisciplinary teams to come to a diagnosis and to optimize the patient care. So that is different mainly with regard to the time frame and the number of the, the discipline that we see. Uh, 